Hello, this is a continuation of a video on my HP 16500C. In the first part, I modified it by replacing the fans with much quieter PC fans, so I didn't have any issues while filming with this device. I attempted to replace the hard drive as well with a compact flash card, but that didn't work out so great, and I ended up going back to the original drive. From here though, we're picking back up and I'm giving some demonstrations on using this device, and it is pretty sweet. Okay, now that it's all done and put back together, um, let's take a look at a few things about using this. So first off, it's synergies with a PC. Now this is a Linux computer. This is running KUbuntu, KUbuntu, um, and this is about the modern equivalent of the kind of system that this would have been meant to run with, uh, like an HP 9000 running HP UX. Um, and I say meant to because it has X windows. Now, if you want to, you can remote control this entirely from your modern computer. And all I'm literally going to do here is press connect and bam, the scope window has popped up. Now, there was a lot of configuration I did on the back end that I'm not going to cover here because it was somewhat proprietary to this exact system. Um, and if I do cover this, it's gonna be worth doing in its own video. But um, it's also not really worth mentioning because even though the, this seems like it's fully working, if I go to um, the oscilloscope card here, we can see a trace over here and it's impossible to see on that screen because it's so tiny, but I'll take a screenshot. Um, uh, and you'll see there's no trace. <laughs> and I, I don't know why. Um, I've read some people got traces to display, others didn't. I don't know why. Um, I don't believe this is running Wayland. I'm pretty sure this is good old fashioned Xorg, so I don't know if it could be a compatibility issue with that, but there are a lot of generations of Unix between this and that, and this is Linux even, so it's not really meant to be run on it, um, but just keep that in mind, even though this theoretically works, it may not work for you, so I don't ever get to use this feature, unfortunately, um, unless I can track down exactly why the trace isn't drawing, which I have no clue about right now, and I'm not finding any logs that are telling me anything useful. Um, so there is that, but that's not terribly useful. Now, I also mentioned the mouse and keyboard works here, so why would you want a mouse and keyboard? Um, it, it is gonna really depend on what you're doing. So let's say you're doing a state and timing module here. We're gonna set this to timing. Um, now, when you're doing something like this, you might want to come up with a custom profile. Like I showed the TRS-80 Model 4 in the beginning, I might want a custom profile just for um, working with the floppy disk controller on here. So I might do M4, um, it's already caps, M4 FDC as my profile name. Uh, for what I'm doing, and then I'll hit enter, I could have clicked or just pressed enter. Uh, and then I would be able to save this configuration um, if I go to, uh, let's see, system, hard disk, it's gonna load it. If I do store, I can ch set just the state timing. I could add a file, M4 FDC, done. Save to file. Actually, I should name this M4 FDC. Uh, I don't know, underscore DI. I don't know. Let's just delete those. Does delete key work? <laughs> to delete everything, yeah. M4 FDC. Okay, we'll save it as that. File description. TRS. Oops, caps lock. TRS. 80. Model 4. It's already caps lock. Model 4. FDC connections and done. And now when I save this, do, 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 it will save a file and we can see here the file name and then Terra City Model 4 FDC connections as the file description. So that's very useful. And then if I reload that, um, it would go back and load the uh, state and timing settings that I put here. So that's really useful in being able to type in as opposed to having to type everything in on the touch screen. <laughs> this is way better. So having a keyboard really helps. Um, it doesn't always do everything like you would really think it would. Um, so you do have to keep that in mind. One thing I should really save here is the custom colors. Um, so you'll notice there's a color difference between 
this screen and that screen that is using the default colors and to the best of my knowledge you can't change these colors that show over here um, you might be able to with x window settings but i don't know how to do that right now um, but you can change them on here if you go to system utilities and then then bam that's the first thing right there uh, you select which color you want to modify. So if I do, um, let's say actually, let's modify uh, color one here, which is the background color. I can go to uh, luminosity and adjust that. Now, unfortunately, there are some background text elements that are black and you can't change that. So if I wanted to make this a black background or even just a really dark gray background, I really can't. Um, if I go back to system configuration and then LAN, We'll see none of that text is visible <laughs> at all uh, just because it doesn't work that way so it's kind of really annoying oh i defaulted it but it doesn't matter i'll fix it later just leave it like that for now even though it's kind of hideous uh so yeah that's really helpful um connecting to the oscilloscope over a network is super duper easy go ahead and do this so um uh, let's bring up the command all right, so the command, um, in this case, I'm, I set the IP address. You can set your IP address uh, here, and then it'll be static. And once I do that, there's a control folder or a data folder that you have to mount. Oh, so this is uh, NFS, and you have to give it a particular older NFS version. But once you do that and then mount it, uh, you can then look into the folders system. And then I can see disk, CD, disk. And then I know there's the hard disk in there or the flexible disk. If I put a floppy disk in, I could actually read the contents of the floppy disk through here. But I'm just gonna go for the hard disk, LS, the hard disk. And we can actually see, where is it? M4 FDC, right there, the configuration for the state and timing card. So if I wanted to, I could copy the configuration off of the oscilloscope over the network right now and uh, I could just swap out any configurations I have anytime I want this way. So that would be useful, but really, I mean, how big is that? LS dash L. I mean, <sighs> configuration 600, <laughs> 6,900 bytes. I mean, really that's nothing. Or is that K? I'm pretty sure that's just bytes. So yeah, that's, <laughs> you're not, never gonna fill up the 500 megabyte hard drive on here. Matter of fact, if we look at the hard disk, we can see <laughs> it's almost entirely free. So yeah, 500 megs is unlimited practically. Really it's data acquisitions, it's gonna fill it up. And that I would want to yank off and put over here if I really cared. Um, I don't know what applications you can use with the data acquired. I haven't figured out how it saves it, if it's CSVs or whatever. Um, I really need some more seat time with this before I do any of that stuff. Um, I mostly just got this and like I said, I needed to quiet it down for filming purposes because it was just way too loud. So yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff like that. Um, so uh, a couple other things here before we move on to trying this out. Um, I do want to do a bit of uh, TRS-80 Model 4 debugging on here. So we'll do that, but uh, two more things here. Uh, one, the logic analyzer pods, these are that's what these are called, are permanently wired. You can't unplug these um, without removing the card, which is a total pain. So you may not want to have all of them connected all the time. Like you might actually be able to see another one back up in there that's not connected currently. Uh, three is overkill for me most likely, but I'll just leave those there. And then another thing, um, the oscilloscope card that's in there, uh, it does take regular BNC probes. You can use, use whatever, but the problem is, that yeah, that's it that's all the cable i've got with a standard probe length uh because it's in the back and this thing is deep it goes way back there so you need um extended probes i'm not sure if regular bnc extensions or bnc cables with a, a coupler would be a good idea um i'm really tempted to make like a little panel down here and then have extensions running from the back of this to the panel and have the probes plugged into that, but I'm not sure if I can get away with that. Um, I know there's a capacitance to the probe cables and I know that could potentially impact the uh, readings that I get. So I need to do a little bit more research about extending probe cables. Um, but yeah, that's that's a whole thing you gotta worry about now because really that's like no length at all, especially when I have it up on top of the shelf. I can barely touch the desk with this. It's the oscilloscope and it's useless for me right now. It's all about the logic analyzer. Um, so, uh, yeah, well, speaking of that, let's go ahead and set it up to see if we can get some logic analyzing going on. 
I wanted to do a logic analyzer demo with my Model 4 here, but uh, there were two things working against me. One, I think the ground connector on this pod was actually not working, so I was just getting a bunch of floating lines, so that's kind of strange. And then the Model 4 actually had a PEBCAC error that was my fault, so I didn't need to do any logic analysis on it at all. I'll cover that in a later video. But the important things you can get to see here are that I was able to use a chip clip to clip onto the Model 4's floppy controller, and then I was able to remove the chip clip and then put it back on later because I needed to move around the logic parts, and this was really nice to work with. I was also able to set up the state and timing card to map all of the probes to a data bus, and it was really, really nice. I'm looking forward to using this on something that goes a lot smoother in the future. All right, the Model 4 is all put back together. That was a whole thing all on its own. I'll probably cover that a little later, but uh, this is now <laughs> my main focus again. So uh, I figure we should take a look at the oscilloscope card next, um, actually, rather than just calling this, but uh, I did want to show you this first. So we get our first little TZ oscilloscope capability here. I have all of this connected to my BK Precision uh, Scopes calibration tester on there. Um, so we can see we're getting a frequency and what I can do is actually set the divisions and zoom in and all sorts of fun stuff. So this is uh, really cool. I like this. So what's going on here is we have above the logic analyzer doing a timing measurement and below we have the oscilloscope. So this is an intermodule measure measurement and we can set up this as a group run. We can tie one into the other and then have them be um, showing up there. This is really, really cool. I, I like this a lot. Let's see if I can do group run and then have this tied to here. Then we can go over to the oscilloscope and then we should be able to pop timing into there. But oh, geez, okay. Um, I don't want to delete all, but individual channels. Uh, yeah, let's do it this way. Boom, there, done. All right. So, group run, start. All right, here we have uh, this is the oscilloscope module now. So, let's go ahead and go to channel. So, uh, first off here, I was able to swap the um, group run around the intermodule to the point where the uh, oscilloscope card is the main card and then the state and timing card is tagged onto that. So when you're setting up an intermodule uh, measurement, you need to define your master module and then it kind of inlines the data with the sub module there and then you can display it. It's really cool. Um, I like this a lot. That's going to be so helpful. Imagine if you're trying to track down a problem where uh, data is intermittent and it's linked to a power supply issue. You don't need two devices running at once. This can do both. So that's going to be really cool. Um, but for now, we can go ahead and uh, get the intermodule stuff disabled here and talk more about the scope card on its own. So let's go back to that. So here we're doing two things. Um, First off, up top, let me just get rid of the one on the bottom here. All right, so this is, again, the uh, calibration coming off of my BK Precision there. So this is a captured waveform. This is not doing anything now, and we can pan around, and then I can still run it, and we can still poke around here. It's pretty cool. I really like this. So this kind of, um, the way that it seems to work is that it does a moving average of a signal expecting it to be consistent. Um, I imagine you can disable that, but I'm not totally sure yet. So I haven't read the manual for this because it's like, it's not just one manual. Every single card has its own manual and they are very verbose. So it's, this isn't just a thing that you pick up and know everything about. That's why it seems like I don't really know what I'm doing because it's hard to learn how to use this. Um, a quick guide to just get going up and running on this would be really nice, but that's not what this is meant for. Um, I think these things were at least $10,000 when they were new, and you probably would have had someone from HP come and educate your staff on how to use it. This was something that I couldn't find an advertised price for. I'm just going based off of like used market prices and third-party dealer stuff. Because uh, basically it seems like if you wanted to buy one of these when it was new, you had to call HP. And I don't know. So I'm just saying that this is a really 
complicated device that you're not meant to just like go pick up at a garage sale and then start using at home. That's that's not what it was meant for. So it's a there's a lot going on here and it's difficult to pierce the veil of how to use it. So I'm trying to do my best here, but uh, I'll get there eventually. But uh, anyway, we do have some really cool stuff here. So I was already in this. We can do auto measure. Um, and if I come back out a bit here, um, so I'm setting markers and the markers have defined states that they're looking for. So I'm looking for a positive slope for the starting marker and a negative slope for the second marker. Um, once we have those two markers measuring something, which is happening, come on, go back. All right, I'll just zoom out which is happening over here. Now it's happening on the first one, whatever. Um, we can see around, once that gets out of the way, the frequency here using auto measure is one kilohertz, which I do know is the calibration frequency of the BK Precision, so that's working. Uh, it's pretty cool to be able to do that uh, as opposed to say an analog scope where you have to actually count the divisions on the display, which is very frustrating. And I've, I know I've had that issue in the past where I was trying to precisely determine what frequency something was, uh, at least the 5150 video and maybe in the Coleco Atom video. So yeah, this is uh, that's gonna be super handy in the future. Um, the other thing that I had displayed on here earlier um, was kind of cool. I'm not as sure about this again, <laughs> um, but I think, uh, come on now, um, what we can do is a differential input. And if we do that, that will work. So channel two doesn't have anything going to it right now. If I hooked it up to that, then it would just be a flat line. So that's not that useful. So channel two should be zero volts right now. So it should be about half the voltage of the other one. And well, we're not really seeing that, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> that this will do differential digitally like this. And I actually do have a use for this um, that I should get to at some point. Part of the model four, nightmare was that uh, I tried to get that floppy drive going after replacing the faceplate, which side note, I do not recommend because it goes all the way back and there is at least one sensor on here that uh, is held on and kind of, well, it's, it keeps the LED on the face in place. It's a whole thing. Anyway, this is now completely out of calibration. Um, you have to attach to a couple of test points on this board and then uh, do a differential measurement and do an external trigger on a particular test point. So that's going to be like a whole thing on its own. So uh, I might do a separate video on differential measurement on this because that would be really useful if I can figure that out. Um, normally you would need like a separate differential scope. I do have one, a Tech 503, or a particular probe module that you can input multiple probes into and then it outputs one differential signal. So if this really does a digital differential signal, that would be incredibly handy. So I'm really curious if that's gonna work out. Well, all right, I think that's it for now. I've done enough rambling on about this thing. I really like it. I'm glad I picked it up. It's going to be immensely useful in the future. Um, so I'm really looking forward to getting more accustomed to using this thing. Now I'm just gonna figure out how I'm gonna work it in my shelf because I really didn't design it for one of these and uh, it's, uh, it's a little big. So, all right, hope you guys enjoyed this. And uh, if you wanna support the channel, I am on Patreon, but for now, that's it. I'll see you next time.